What's up everybody? It's your boy Meme here. For breakfast I um had pancakes and toast and sausage and bacon um and eggs and that was good. My parents made a big dinner. Big breakfast I mean. Uh and now they're going to a hotel so they can go to a concert tonight and then they're coming back tomorrow morning. So I'm home alone. Uh the reason why the the so that's the reason why this video is so long because right now I'm doing my homework on um Society and Culture by Hannah Arendt um, for English 101, and I have just been reading it, but also the robot vacuum's been running, so whenever I finish writing down a little note or an annotation, I immediately walk up and get out of my... It's because I have a lot of caffeine in my system. I already drank one of these. Um, and so when I, as soon as I'm done reading and I'm making an annotation, I get up and go out and look at the robot vacuum. So instead, I'm just going to... Um, just just read this essay in front of you guys and make annotations. Uh, this isn't going to be an interesting video. But I think recording myself uh, makes me do notes better, so. Yeah, I'm just going to be quiet, pretty much. I, will, I also like to read out loud, but when I'm writing my annotations, you aren't going to know what they are. and I might try to explain something, but you know. Um, generally speaking, I think it has been the great good fortune of this country, great good fortune, generally speaking, I think it's been the great good fortune of this country to have this intermediary stage of good and cultured society play a relatively minor role in its development. But the disadvantage of this good fortune today is that those few who still make a stand against mass culture as an unavoidable consequence of mass society are tempted to look upon these earlier phenomena of society and culture as a kind of golden age and lost paradise, comma, precisely because they know so little of it. America has only too well acquainted with the barbarian philistinism, philistinism? of the Novu Reich. What is half of the, sorry, okay. I, I don't think I should go to the second page for now. Um, I haven't annotated this bottom paragraph at all, so I, I should probably try to understand this. Generally speaking, I think it's been to the great good fortune of this country to have the inter, to have this intermediary stage of good and cultured society play a relatively minor role in its development. And what uh, Hannah is referring to here is, um, uh, I'm actually not sure. Generally speaking, I think it's been to the great good fortune of this country to have this intermediary state of good and cultured society play a relatively minor role in its development. Okay, so when it's when she's talking about the intermediary stage, um, she's referring to like the sort of the time I think in the industrial revolution, maybe. Um, I think she's referring to maybe the industrial revolution and how um, generally, previously, the concept of like culture um, and like society, um, it used to basically just be people who would like consume art and like have like cheese and wine parties. Um, but once everybody had free time, I actually, I actually have a, Yeah, so when the first people, uh, this is a note that I took, when the first people to have free time due to industry took advantage of it, thinking that they too were elite, uh, when they were just workers with more free time. So, um, the, there were so little, when, when the concept of, like, I don't know, I don't know. The concept of the modern individual was made by people like Rousseau. Society was still exclusionary to the mass. Oh, when? When the concept of the modern individual was made by people like Rousseau, society was still exclusionary to the masses. I wonder if this is when the concept was made. If when this concept was made was coincided with the modern individual. And the modern individual is referring to someone described with words such as loneliness on the previous page. Oh, right. So on the page before, Hannah was like, Hannah? Hannah Arendt? Hannah. Hannah Arendt. Um, she was like, 
Yeah, in fact, all the traits that crowd psychology has meanwhile discovered in mass man. His loneliness, regardless of his adaptability, his excitability and lack of standards, his capacity for consumption accompanied by inability to judge or even to distinguish, above all, his, egocent his egocentricity and faithful alienation from the world which, since Rousseau, he mistakes for self-alienation, all these traits first appeared in good society, where there was no con question of masses, numerically speaking. Oh! Oh my god! Wait, I just completely- uh, I, I misunderstood that sentence previously. Um, so, okay, so... All these traits first appeared in good society when there was no good question of the masses. Okay, so, okay, so here, when she's listing out how people are- how, like, the mass man... Yeah, in fact, all the traits that crowd psychology has, meanwhile, discovered in the mass man. And then she describes, like, loneliness, but loneliness is either isolation nor solitude, and, like, his capacity for consumption and stuff. Um, that's referring to when people in, like, the masses became part of, like, mass society, um, and how this concept of, like, the mass man and his loneliness, regardless of his adaptability, his excitability and lack of standards, his capacity for consumption, accompanied by an ability to judge or even distinguish, above all, his egocentricity and that faithful alienation from the world, which, since Rousseau, he mistakes for self-alienation. Um, how all these first appeared in, quote, good society, which is, like, richer people with more time, uh, and didn't have to, who didn't have to work all the time. Um, and there was, quote, no question of the masses, numerically speaking. So all of these phenomena had appeared in mass society before. Um, no, had appeared in good society before, which is like rich people. Um, it's just that the masses didn't question it because it, they were so far removed from the concept of the masses. So that, I, I think that's what Hannah means. Um, That's an important thing to write down. This is, I should. Oh my god. That's so annoying. Oh my god. Why did I do that? Okay. Um. First page, comma. Hannah is talking about how um, all these negative traits. were present in good society. Comma, but not noticed until co-opted into mass society. Period. Okay. And by that, by now, I would get out of my room and look at the robot vacuum for a minute. Um, generally speaking, I think it's been the great good fortune of this country to have this in, in intermediary stage of good and cultured society play a relatively minor role in its development. So it's referring to like good, the role of good and cultured society is like fine art folks. Like when America was made, all the fine art people were primarily in France and they already had the French Revolution. No, they didn't. When was the French Revolution? A little, was it before or after the, when was the French Revolution? 
Oh yeah, 1789. So a little after America's revolution. Um, okay, so. Relatively minor role in its development. Good. Society. Played. Minor role in founding America. Pros. I'm going to do a pros and cons list of this because that, that's what she describes afterwards. Um, listen to this. My desk makes a freaky noise when I rock it back and forth. You've got to kick it up against the wall. So then it sort of sticks to the wall and doesn't shake around like that. Um, generally speaking, okay. Um, but the disadvantage of this good fortune today is that those few who still make a stand against mass culture as an unavoidable consequence of mass society. Oh yeah, also earlier she mentioned how mass society is sort of inevitably creates mass culture. You can't have mass society without mass culture. Um, but the disadvantage of this good fortune today is that those few who still make a stand against mass culture as an unavoidable consequence of mass society are tempted to look upon these earlier phenomena in society as culture as kind of a golden age and lost paradise. Okay. So instead of our pros and cons list, I'm just, I'm just gonna say This results in individuals who are against mass culture looking toward exclusive exclusionary quote-unquote good culture as a golden age and this actually this actually kind of relevant now because you go on X I'm on blue sky by the way um yesterday was it yesterday um I think it was yesterday uh, I was in the Arch Linux Discord server and somebody totally posted a Blue Sky invite code. So I just quickly downloaded the app and um, typed in, made a handle. I'm on Blue Sky now. I'm completely off Twitter. Um, when I first deleted Twitter, uh, I went from Twitter to Threads, and that's when Threads was getting really popular. Threads was fine for a couple days and now it's just bots. Um, but now I'm on Blue Sky, and Blue Sky is like really good. Blue Sky is a great, great app. Um, it's not as active as Twitter, of course, but um, it's a lot more customizable. Their feed system is really interesting. Um, the app is a little buggy, but it's expected at the beta. Um, Blue Sky is a lot of fun. Um, I might, you know, if I when I get my invite code, I might invite one of you people. We'll see. Um, but yeah, so you go on you go on X, right, and you see all these people like Culture Critic or whatever his name is. All those people with statue profile pictures um, who you know, we're born in America, grew up in America usually, or we're just born in like a modern, in like the modern day, uh, and didn't, like, like what Hannah Arendt says here, like didn't grow up in a time in which, um, like, there was an obvious exclusion between like good society and mass society, um, and how America just entirely skipped that period because it was like 10 years before the French Revolution, right, the founding of America. So uh, this results in a lot of people who are against mass society, which is fine, you could be against mass society, but it's saying that everybody who's against mass society, um, like, instead of doing their own thing, they sort of just look at what good society used to be and consider that to be the ideal, when they didn't even live through that and when it was probably bad, I assume. I assume. My uh, English professor, Renee, um, should I just say his name? That's crazy. That's crazy I just said his name. Uh, 
who's gonna watch this 15 minutes in like half of this video is silence but he talks about how it's important to um listen to your to read the paper like without with like without bias like don't in try to interpret the words right just like consume the words and have them appear in your mind you know um yeah This advantage of this good fortune today is that those few who still make a stand against mass culture as an unavoidable as an unavoidable consequence of mass society are tempted to look upon these earlier phenomena of society and culture as kind of a golden age and lost paradise. Precisely because they know so little of it. Oh god, now here are all the weird words. I, I have MarianWebster.com open up on my laptop here, but it's still annoying. Uh, America has only too well acquainted, has been only too well acquainted with the barbarian Philistinism of the Nouveau Riche. Okay, what's Philistinism? It's like the act of being Philistinous. Um, Philistinism. Philistine. A native inhabitant of ancient Philista. <laughs> What? What's Felissa? A southwestern part of ancient Palestine. Anyway, um, a person who is guided by materialism and is usually disdainful or intellectual and is usually disdainful of intellectual or artistic values. A Philistine attitude toward opera. Guided my... Oh, wait. No, that's that's the second definition of Philistine, which is one uninformed in a special area of knowledge. And that special area of knowledge in this example is opera, so someone would be a Philistine attitude. Would ha Someone would have a Philistine attitude toward opera. But Philistine, the noun is someone who is guided by materialism and is usually disdainful of intellectual or artistic values. So, yeah. Okay. Um, this is so much coffee I'm drinking. <laughs> makes me more efficient. It makes me think better. Um, Okay, the barbarian Philistinism of the nouveau riche. Okay, well, first let me let me write down the definition of Philistinism. F Philistinism. Philistine. The robot vacuum might bump up against my door right now. I'm gonna lock my door. Uh, whenever my parents are at home, I like to lock my door because it's spooky. <laughs> I can see the vacuum right under my door crack. That's crazy. I need to blow my nose. I'm still a little sick, but I think I won't be sick by Tuesday. I'm gonna go off camera to blow my nose. <laughs> is that gross to have on like mic? Is it, is it gross that I didn't mute myself? I'm gonna do it again, watch. <laughs> is that gross? <laughs> God, see, normally I'd be talking to myself <laughs> um, instead of recording myself, but, you know, I, I seem a little less crazy uh, recording myself talking to myself rather than 
just talking to myself. Because technically, I could just say I'm talking to you guys. Um. Oh yeah, I'm writing down the definition of philistine. Uh, someone... Guided by materialism. Disdainful. of intellectual or artistic values. Nouveau reach. I know that Nouveau is a NVIDIA driver on Linux. <laughs> that sucks, because it's open source. Not because it's open source, but, you know, NVIDIA's drivers are better. Um, no Nouveau Riche. A person of newly rich. Oh, so it's like, oh, Nouveau Riche. <laughs> French is a fake language, it's just, it's new rich, okay. Oh, you could just tell, nouveau rich, like you could just tell it's new rich, okay. I'm, I'm crazy, maybe I should understand French. I use the restroom here, but this time I'm gonna pause my, pause my recording before doing a bodily function. The robot vacuum was in the bathroom while I was using the restroom, and so it was, it was a little awkward. Um, yeah, so nouveau riche. Nouveau Riche, N O U V E A U. Dash New Money. Okay, so let's see if this makes sense. Precisely because they know so little of it, America has only ha, has been only too well acquainted with the barbarian phil, philistinism of the Nouveau Riche. Oh, phil philistinism. Okay, 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 okay. Because they know so little of it. America has only been too well acquainted with the barbarian philistinism of the nouveau riche. So the barbarian person guided by materialism, disdainful of intellectual or artistic values, of the n new money. So people who have like new money are um guided by materialism and are disdainful of intellectual and artistic values, pretty much. Which is kind of fair. Says me, I, I'm not an authority on that. God, I'm a crazy person. The meta, um, you know when you have a can of something and then there's like a little liquid at the end and you can't get it because of the lip? The meta is to just like shock on the rest. And then it's empty. It's totally empty. You can put it in the recycling and it won't leak everywhere and make the recycling bin sticky. Um, okay. Man, this is gonna be, like, one of my longest videos. <laughs> That's crazy. Um, but it has only a nodding acquaintance with the equally annoying cultural and education ph philistinism of a society where culture actually has what Mr. Shills called snob value and where it's a matter to be educated. Okay, so...
Okay, so people who are snobs about art is an equally annoying culture as people who are Philistines about art. Do I look like a crazy person right now? No, okay. Why do I keep, my hair looks so good right now. I look, no offense, I look, I look really attractive. <laughs> Uh, my, my skin is looking a lot better. Um, I still have like these lines when I smile, look at that. Okay, so like lines on my face down here, um, which sucks, uh, cause I'm 18 years old and I shouldn't have lines on my face. However, um, you know, uh, what, um, they're barely there though. Um, I, what, I'm 18 year, um, <laughs> I'm 18 years old and I shouldn't have lines on my face. However, um, I did stop using a lot of the stuff in the morning, like my sunscreen, I stopped using that. Uh, and my uh, red, like, fragranced moisturizer, which I just use because my parents buy it. And, uh, and they probably buy it because I use it, but you know, I'd rather them blame them than blame myself. Um, and so my skin's getting a little better. I think I'm allergic to like maybe the sunscreen, which sucks, which really sucks. So I might get better sunscreen, but you know. I bought the Yeezy Gap round jacket too for $300 yesterday. Probably one of my stupidest purchases. I'm a Philistine. <laughs> no, I'm not a Philistine. I'm, I'm snobby, <laughs> which is equally as annoying as a Philistine according to Hannah, but you know. Um, God, a, a, true, a true snob would talk about Hannah Arendt on a first name basis, like we're buddies. Um, okay. This cultural philistinism today in Europe, rather than this cultural philistinism, is today in Europe rather a matter of the past, for the simple reason that the whole development of modern art started from and remained committed to a profound mistrust of not only cultural philistinism but also the word culture itself. The cultural phil is the next page the last. Ugh! I have three more pages until I read half. It's it's Jover, guys. It's Jover. Um, this cultural philistinism today is today in Europe rather a matter of the past for the simple reason that the whole development of modern art started from and were made committed to a profound mistrust of not only cultural philistinism, but also the word culture itself. This cultural philistinism today in Europe is rather, it is mat. This cultural... Is the vacuum gonna bump up against my door again? Kill yourself. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay. Um, this cultural philistinism is today in Europe rather a matter of the past for the simple reason that the whole development of modern art started from and remained committed to a profound mistrust of cultural philistinism. So the reason why modern art came around is not only because of a distrust of philistinism, which is like people who don't care about art, right? So modern art, according to Hannah, modern art was made because so there used to be cultural philistinism in Europe, but now there isn't anymore, and the whole development of modern art um, is stems from a mistrust of cultural philistinism. From mistrusting, mistrusting, is that a word? <laughs> Cultural Philistines. I'm a little bit confused about the part where it talks about the word culture itself because isn't a, a cultural Philistine someone who doesn't care about culture? So, how can modern art not only be a reaction? to people who don't care about art, but also people who don't, 
to people who use the word culture. <laughs> Maybe I'm reading this wrong. I'm not French. I'm not German. I mean, Arendt? That's a German name. She's like, a, she was like a Jew in Germany, and then she like fled to France, and then Spain, and then New York. And then, then she wrote about um, Adolf Eichmann for The New Yorker. Uh, development, I'm going to underline, development of modern art started from and remained committed to a profound mistrust not only of cultural philistinism, but of the word culture itself. Okay. It is still an open question whether it is more difficult to discover the great authors of the past without the help of any tradition, rather than it is of any tradition than it is to rescue them from the rubbish of educated Philistinism. Isn't educated Philistinism a contradiction in terms? It is still an open question whether it is more difficult to discover the great authors of the past without the help of any tradition than it is to rescue them from the rubbish of educated... Okay, so Hannah's just being silly here. Than it is to rescue them from the rubbish of educated Philistinism. Like, shut up! <laughs> You're being so annoying right now. Okay, um... Okay. All my friends are dead. Push me to the edge. You know what song? Um. I shouldn't scratch my eyebrows. Um, it is still an open question whether it is more difficult to discover the great authors of the past without the help of any tradition than it is to rescue them from the rubbish of educated philistinism. I'll take a note of that. That's embarrassing. Um, yeah, so I wrote, is it easier to discover past authors with the help of tradition or to rescue them from the grasps of cultural philistines? Okay. 
and this task of preserving the past without the help of tradition, and often even against traditional standards and interpretations, is not the same for the whole of Western civilization. God, okay, I, this is one of those where I feel like my English professor is right, in which I shouldn't have any preconceived notions of the text. This woman is a Jewish German American. She fled Germany and the Nazis. She's anything but right wing. However, when you hear people talk about Western tradition, you know, and uh, Western civilization, you know, in America, modern day, your preconceived notions lead you to believing they're speaking about something that I definitely wouldn't agree with. Um, however, I'm sure, I'm sure, I, I'm just, you know, I'm just, when I see things, my mind grasps at straws for what I re recognized in the past. And whenever somebody rec talks about Western civilization, it's like Jordan Peterson talking about it. And, you know, I don't really like Jordan Peterson, so I don't, I don't think anybody likes Jordan Peterson. So um, I, I feel like I should absolve myself from preconceived notions about people describing Western civilization because this Rene Arnaud, uh, Rene Arnaud, this Hannah Arendt essay is way far away from the preconceived notions of 21st century descriptions of Western civilization, you know? Um, so, it is still an open question whether it is more difficult to discover the great authors of the past without the help of any tradition than it is to rescue them from the rubbish of educated Philistinism. And this task of preserving the past without the help of tradition, and often even against traditional standards and interpretations, is the same for the whole of Western civilization. This task of preserving the past. This task of preserving the past without the help of tradition, and often even the traditional standards and interpretations, is the same for the whole of Western civilization. Intellectually, though not socially, America and Europe are in the same situation. The thread of tradition is broken and we must discover the past for ourselves. That is, read its authors as though nobody had ever read them before. In this task, mass society is much less in our way than good, educated society, and I suspect that this kind of reading is not uncommon in the 19th century America, precisely because this country was still that unstoried wilderness from which so many American writers and artists tried to escape. That American fiction and poetry have so suddenly, be have so suddenly and richly come into their own ever since Whitman and Melville may have something to do with this. It would be unfortunate indeed if out of the dilemmas and distractions of mass culture and mass society there should arise an altogether unwarranted and idle yearning for the state of affairs which is not better but only a little only a bit more old-fashioned. <laughs> what? It would be unfortunate indeed if out of the dilemmas and distractions of mass culture and mass society there should arise an altogether unwarranted and idle yearning for a state of affairs which is not only which is not better and only a little more old-fashioned. That's, <laughs> it's so weird how uh, applicable this is to the modern day um, for being written in the 1950s. Um, and the eager and uncritical acceptance of such, of such obviously snobbish and philistine terms as highbrow, middlebrow, and lowbrow is a rather obvious sign. For the only non-social and authentic for, for the only non-social and authentic criterion for works of culture is, of course, their relative per permanence and even their ultimate immortality. The point of this matter is, as soon as the immortal works of the past became the object of refinement and acquaintance and acquired the status with which, which went with it, they lost their most important and elemental quality, which is to grasp and move the reader or spectator throughout the centuries. The very word culture became suspect Primary, precisely because it indicated that pursuit of perfection, which to Matthew Arnold was identical with the pursuit of sweetness? Pursuit of sweetness and light. It was not Plato, but a reading of Plato, prompted by the ult ulterior motive of self-perfection that became suspect, and the pursuit of sweetness and light, with all its overtones in good society, was held in contempt because of its rather devious effort to keep reality out of one's life by looking at everything through a veil of sweetness and light. The astounding recovery of the creative arts in the 20th century, and the less apparent but perhaps no less real recovery of the greatness of the past, began good society as its monopolizing grip on culture, together with its dominant position in society as a whole. 
Here we are not concerned with society, however, but with culture, or rather with what happens to culture under the different conditions of society and of mass society. In society, culture, even more than other realities, had become what only began to be called a value, that is, a social commodity which should be, which could be circulated and cashed in on as social coinage for the purpose of acquiring social status. Cultural objects were transformed into values when the cultural philistine seized upon them as currency by which he bought a higher position in society, higher, that is, than his own opinion he deserved either by nature or by birth. Cultural values, therefore, were what values have always been, exchange values. In passing from hand to hand, they are worn down like an old coin. They lost the faculty which is originally peculiar to all cultural things, the faculty of arresting our attention and moving us. This process of transformation was called the devaluation of values, and its end came with the bargain sale of values. Asferkopf der Werte, during the 20s and 30s, when cultural and moral values were sold out together. Perhaps the chief difference of, between society and mass society is that society wanted culture, evaluated and devalued. The vacuum just said something. Is it done vacuuming? I guess I'll find out if I hear it emptying the dustbin. What do people say on Discord? Oh. Well, I can see what you can see my body. <laughs> I'm gonna switch what flannel I'm wearing, one sec. I'm back, I didn't change my flannel, I was just a little sweaty. So I walked around the house um, and I threw away my cans of coffee and the vacuum finished. Uh, it was recording cause it was like returning to charge. That's why it spoke. Um, and so it emptied the dustbin while I was, while the video was paused. Um, yeah, I'm a little chilly now cause it's, it's chilly out there. It's chilly outside of my room. Oh no! Oh no! I have a coffee stain on, on my on my essay. No. Oh well, it's endearing. <laughs> okay. Oh my god. And I literally I was talking to you guys about how there isn't any extra coffee left over in the can after you shotgun it, but I totally just disproved my point. I could have sworn that's the case though. Um. Okay. Okay. Um, where was I? <sighs> Cultural, I need, I need, I need gum. Cultural objects were transformed into values when the cultural philistine seized upon as a currency by which he bought a higher position in society, higher, that is, than in his own opinion he deserved either by nature or by birth. We already read this. Cultural values, therefore, were what values have always been, exchange values. In passing from hand to hand, they were, they were worn down like an old coin. They lost the faculty which is originally peculiar to all cultural things the faculty of arresting our attention and moving us. This process of transformation was called the devaluation of values, and its end came with the bargain sale of values, during the 20s and 30s when cultural and moral values were sold out together. Perhaps the chief difference between the society and mass society is that society wanted culture, evaluated and devaluated cultural things into social commodities, used and abused them for its own selfish purposes, but did not consume them. Even in their most worn out shapes, these things remained things. They were not consumed and swallowed up, but retained their worldly objectivity. Mass society, on the contrary, 
when it's not culture but entertainment. And the wares offered by the entertainment industry are indeed consumed by society just as are any other consumer goods. The, process, the products needed for entertainment serve the life process of society, even though they may not be as necessary for this life as bread and meat. They serve, as the phrase is, to, to, to while away time. To while away, to, to while away time. Like, what, like while I was doing something, like to while away. That's weird. Um, They serve, as the phrase is, to while away time, and the vacant time, which is wild away, is not leisure time, strictly speaking. That is, time in which we are truly liberated from all cares and activities necessitated by the life process, and therefore free for the world and its culture. It's, it is rather leftover time, which is still biological in nature, leftover after labor and sleep have received their due. Vacant time, which entertainment is supposed to fill a hiatus in the biologically conditioned cycle of labor. Oh my god. Okay. Um, vacant time, which entertainment is supposed to fill, is a hiatus in the biologically conditioned cycle of labor, in the metabolism of man with nature, as Marx used to say. Under modern conditions, this hiatus is constantly growing. There is more and more time freeze that must be filled with entertainment. But this enormous increase in vacant time does not change the nature of the time. Entertainment, like labor and sleep, is irre 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 irrevocably. Irre I've heard this word said, but I can't. I R R E. Irrevocably. 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 Okay. Oh my god. Okay. Okay. Um. Okay. Okay. Are not things. Cultural objects whose excellence is measured by their ability to withstand the life process and to become permanent. And biological life as always, whether one is laboring or at rest, engaged in consumption or in the passive reception of amusement, metabolism feeding on things by devouring them. The commodities the entertainment industry offers are not things. Cultural objects whose, eth whose excellence is measured by their ability to withstand the life process and to become permanent upper appurtenances. Appurtenances? What, what, what is that? Appurtenance. 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 Okay. Leftover after labor have sleep have received their due. Vacant time, yeah. vacant time, which entertainment is supposed to fill with a hiatus in biologically conditioned cycle of labor and the metabolism of a ma of man with nature, as Marx used to say. Under modern conditions, this hiatus is constantly growing. There is more and more time free that must be filled with entertainment, but this enormous increase in vacant time does not change the nature of the time. Entertainment, like like labor and sleep, is irrevocably, irrevocably. 
Like labor and sleep, it is irrevocably part of the biological life process. And biological life, as always, whether one is laboring or at rest, engaged in consumption, or in the paths of reception of amusement, a metabolism feeding on things by devouring them. The commodities that the entertainment industry offers are not things, cultural objects who is cultural objects whose excellence is measured by their ability to withstand the life process and to become permanent appur appurtenances of the world. A subordinate part or adjunct. Um, so appurtenances either means accessory objects, the appurtenances of wealth, or a subordinate part or adjunct, which is the appurtenance of welcome is fashion and ceremony. To become permanent appurtenances of the world. Accessor I guess I guess it means except accessory objects. Appurtenances means the commodities the entertainment industry offers are not things, cultural objects whose excellence is measured by their ability to withstand the life process and to become permanent appurtenances of the world. And they should not be judged according to these standards, nor are they values which should which exist to be used and exchanged. They are rather consumer goods destined to be used up, as are any other consumer goods. Panis ed Panis ed Circenses truly belong together, both are necessary for life first preservation. What are you saying? It's another French word. French words. Panis et Circenses. I'll just look that up. It's not in Merriam-Webster. It's a Latin phrase that means bread and circuses. Oh, it's not French. <laughs> What's the difference? Um, God. Um... That means bread and circuses, and refers to the provision of entertainment and sustenance by the government to appease public discontent. Okay. Provision of entertainment from the government. Panis et circenses, 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 panis et circenses truly belong together. Both are necessary for, oh, like bread and circuses truly belong together? <laughs> why, why not just say bread and circuses? Because maybe you're not referring to Latin phrase and its connotations, probably. Go some floss, go to floss. Um, God, okay. Um, okay. Panis et circenses truly belong together. Both are necessary for life, for its preservation and recuperation. 
both vanish in the course of the life process, that is, must constantly be produced anew and offered anew, lest this process cease entirely. The standards by which both are th the standards by which both should be judged are indeed freshness and novelty. The standards by which are today. I'm gonna kill myself. Not actually. I'm, I'm not actually gonna kill myself. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, okay. Um, panis s panis et circenses truly belong together. Both are necessary for life, for its preservation and recuperation. Both vanish in the course of the life process. That is, both must constantly be produced anew and offered anew, lest this process cease entirely. The standards by which both should be judged are indeed freshness and novelty. Standards by which we today, and I think quite mistakenly, judge cultural and artistic objects as well. Things which are supposed to remain in the world even after we have left it. As long as the entertainment industry industry produces its own consumer goods, all is well, and we can no longer reproach it for the non-durability non of its articles, then we can reproach a break bakery because it produces goods which, if they are not to spoil, must be consumed as they are made. Oh my god, is my brain like slowing down or is this getting harder to read? Maybe I should drink more coffee, maybe, maybe that'll fix it guys. Um, okay, okay. 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 Oh my god. Okay. Our Lo Leo the P.O. the movie. And it's reading Hannah Arendt. Okay, I have to use the restroom. <laughs> Be right back. I'm back. I was also on my phone for a long time. <laughs> it's been about half an hour. Um, so, yeah, back to the, the paper. I'm going to start with Penny, uh, Panis et Circenses. Penis et Circenses truly belong together. Both are necessary for life, for its preservation and recuperation. Both vanish in the course of the life process. That is, both must constantly be produced anew and offered anew, lest this process cease entirely. The standards by which both should be judged are indeed freshness and novelty. By standards which are we today, and I think quite mistakenly, judge cultural and artistic objects as well, things which are supposed to remain in the world long after we have left it. As long as the entertainment industry produces its own consumer goods, all is well, and we can no more reproach we can no more reproach it for the non-durability of its articles than we can reproach a bakery because it produces goods which, if they are not to spoil, must be consumed as soon as they are made. It has always been the mark of educated philistinism to despise entertainment and amusement because no value could be derived from them. In so far as we are all subject to life's great cycle, we all stand in need of entertainment and amusement in some form or other, and in... and... okay. Oh my god, okay, yeah, whew, whew, okay. Insofar as we all are, insofar as we are all subject to life, insofar as we are all subjects to life, insofar as we are all subject to life's great cycle, we all stand in need of entertainment and amusement in some form or another, and it is sheer hypocrisy or social snobbery to deny that we can't be amused and entertained by exactly the same things which amuse and entertain the masses of our fellow men. As far as the survival of culture is concerned, it certainly is less threatened by those who fill the vacant time with amusement and entertainment than those who fill it with some haphazard educational gadget in order to improve our, their social standing. Okay, and that's half, and I just need to annotate now. So, let's actually understand what's going on here. Okay.
Okay. What she mean when she says, in this task, mass society is much less in our way than good and educated society. So like mass society is less in our way than good society. And I suspect, and I suspect that this kind of reading, I assume this reading of society, was not uncommon in the 19th century. Uh, in 19th century America, precisely because this country was still that unstoried wilderness from which so many American writers and artists try to escape. I suspect that this kind of reading was not uncommon in 19th century America precisely because this country was still that unstoried wilderness from which so many American writers and artists tried to escape. Uh, this is a question for my professor. What does Hannah mean by unstoried Wilderness? Question mark. It would be unfortunate indeed if out of dilemmas and distractions of mass culture and mass society there should rise an altogether unwarranted and idle yearning for the state of affairs which is not better but only a little bit more old-fashioned. You know, that reminds me of the opinions of a lot of American conservatives. It would be unfortunate indeed if out of the dilemmas and distractions of mass culture and mass society there should arise an altogether unwarranted and idle yearning for a state of affairs which is not better but only a little bit more old-fashioned. And the eager and uncritical acceptance of such obviously snobbish and philistine terms as highbrow, middlebrow, and lowbrow is a rather ominous sign. Ominous sign of what? The dilemmas and distractions of mass culture arising in altogether How is highbrow, middlebrow, and lowbrow representative of a yearning for a state of affairs, which is not better, but only a little bit more old-fashioned? How, how is highbrow, middlebrow, and lowbrow like an ominous sign of that? For the only non-social and authentic criterion of works of culture is, of course, their relative terminants and even ultimate immortality. The point of the matter is that as soon as the immortal works of the past became the object of refinement and requ an acquired status which went with it, they lost their most important and elemental copy quality, which is to grasp and move the reader or spectator throughout the centuries. Oh, okay, so art, I think she's saying that art itself is meant to sort of swing you around different centuries and like when the art was made and like what it's talking about. But um, instead of that, um, sort of Philistine, Philistine people, uh, Philistines, um, they 
are like, instead viewing art as an object of refinement, instead of viewing art as an object of its time, uh, and intentionally so to bring you through the centuries. Philistines are viewing art as objects of, re of refinement rather than literal objects of their time, unintentionally made to bring you to the date of creation of the art. That's sort of what I was describing. So here, when it talks about um, the very word culture became suspect precisely because it indicated that pursuit of perfection, which to Matthew Arnold was identical with the pursuit of sweetness and light, it was not Plato, but a reading of Plato prompted by the ulterior motive of self-perfection that became suspect. When did it, the word culture became suspect? It was Plato, not a reading of Plato, prompted by the ulterior motive of self of self-perception, of self-perfection, -per not percussion, self-perfection self that became suspect. The very word culture became suspect precisely because it indicated that pursuit of perfection, which to Matthew Arnold was identical with the pursuit of sweetness and life. It was not Plato, but a reading of Plato, prompted by the ulterior motive of self-perfection that became suspect. And the pursuit of sweetness and light, with all its overtones of good society, was held in contempt because of its rather obvious effort to keep reality out of one's life by looking at it through a veil of sweetness and light. So, a reading of Plato, um, sort of veiled by, like, looking through rose-tinted glasses, pretty much. You're looking at, you're looking at Plato through rose-tinted glasses, and these rotated, and these rose-tinted glasses are the pursuit of sweetness and light. Um, sweetness and light is like, has the general vibe of a good society. That's what Hannah means when she's talking about the, um, the overtones of a good society, sweetness and light. Like theoretically seems like a good part of society, but um, it's a rather obvious effort to keep reality out of one's life by looking at everything through that lens. So, you know, society is like sort of the way it is, right? And instead of actually making society better, uh, people, I assume that like Philistines or something, um, view sweetness and light, view society through sweetness and light, which um, is an obvious effort to keep reality out of one's life. Yeah.
sorry. Um, The astounding recovery of the creative arts in the 20th century, and a less apparent but perhaps no real recovery of the greatness of the past, began when good society lost its monopolizing grip on culture, together with its dominant position in society as a whole. So art came back when good society lost its grip on the culture. Here we are not concerned with society, however, but with the culture, or rather what happens to the culture under diff the different conditions of society and of mass society. Here we are not concerned with here we are not concerned with society, however, but with the culture. Oh, here we are not with concerned here we are not concerned with society, however, but with culture, or rather what happens to culture under different conditions of society and mass society. In society, culture, even more than other realities, had become only what began to be called a value. Oh god, I already read this. I just, it's, it's, I'm just reading words, but not only comprehending what, what just happened. Um, In society, culture became what to be called a value. And culture became a social commodity which could be circulated and cashed in on social coinage for the purpose of acquiring social status.
Culture became a value in society to be traded around. Culture became a commodity assigned to social status. Cultural objects were transformed into values when the cultural Philistine seized upon them as a currency, which he bought a higher position in society. Oh, this is about commodic commodification of art. <laughs> um... Oh my god, I'm the philistine who's buying a high. I, I, I bought the Yeezy Gap round jacket, dog. I'm the philistine buying a higher position in society by associating myself with the art of a pro prolific artist, dog. That sucks. Is that sort of inevitable though when you're buying nice clothes? Isn't it, isn't it inevitable to like try to align yourself with the vision of the creative director? I don't know. Someone messaged me. I need a white shoe that's comfortable and looks good, but no Air Forces, because I'm an adult now, and Air Forces are the little tykes shoes. I'll respond to that later. <laughs> um, God, I, I have a vague interest in shoes, and then Everybody asks me what shoes they should buy. I I, I don't know. It's your choice. I, did, I, I how, Why should I know what shoes you should buy? Like, oh, what's popular? Like, Sambas. But they won't be popular in, like, six months. So, like, I don't even know if Sambas are still popular. I haven't been on TikTok. TikTok's where all the fashion stuff is happening. All the fashion trends are happening. The Philistine, the Philistine bought a higher position in society with... with the currency the philistine bought a higher position in society by associating cultural objects with values higher that is than it in his own opinion he deserved either by nature or by birth He lost faculty, which is originally peculiar to all cultural things, the faculty of arresting our attention and moving us. This process of transformation was called the devaluation of values, and its end came with the bargain sale of values during the 20s and 30s when cultural and moral values were sold out altogether. Ask Renee. Perhaps the chief difference between society and mass society is that society wanted culture, evaluated and devaluated from cultural things into social commodities, used and abused them for their own social purposes, 
for their own selfish person. The difference between society and mass society is that society wanted culture evaluated and devaluated. Cultural things in the social commodities used to abuse them for their own selfish purposes, but did not con consume them. Even in the most worn out shapes, these things remained things. They were not consumed and swallow up, swallowed up, but retained their worldly objectivity. Okay, I'm going to write this at the bottom because this seems like sort of the thesis of this section. Society did art. It was a currency of culture to be traded around. When mass society did art, it became a product to be consumed. No objectivity. Purely for entertainment. We're almost done. Um, okay. They serve as the phrases to while away time, and the vacant time which is wild away is not leisure time, strictly speaking. That is, time in which we are truly liberated from all cares and activity. Oh, okay. And therefore free of the world and its culture, it is rather leftover time, which is still biological in nature, leftover after labor and sleep have received their due. Vacant time, which entertainment is supposed to fill, is the hiatus between a biologically conditioned cycle of labor, the metabolism of man with nature. Under modern conditions, the hiatus is constantly growing. This is so interesting. I'm dying. I'm dying, you guys. I'm actually dying in real life. I'm dying. <laughs> I still see your shadows in my room Can't take back the love that I gave you To the point where I love and I hate you But I cannot trade you so I must replace you -na 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 -na. Um, the first time I ever heard that song was a Jay Schlatt video on OpenTTD and he did a, like a, um, he did a Lucid Dreams OpenTTD parody in the middle of his video and so, um, so I must replace you Everything after that line, I only know the open TTT J slot version, which is crazy. Um, man, he's got to keep doing that Radiohead series. When's he starting with that? God, I remember, I remember SMP Live. Oh my God. I forgot I had an influence on Jay Schlaff's life. Um, wow. Uh, 
when uh, he was doing SMP Live, he was like, can I get a PogChamp in the chat? And everybody was typing PogChamp, but I misspelled it, and I spelled PogChamo. And uh, he said, thou, you just said PogChamo. That's crazy. And uh, then he named his pickaxe PogChamo. It was a silk touch diamond pickaxe. It was before Netherite was invented. And, um, you know, he ended up losing it to someone. And he asked, like, call me Carson if he had PogChamo. It was so crazy, because it was a message that I sent. It was crazy. I have like noises when I touch them. It's weird. They they make like goopy, no like squishy noises. It's weird. They're just orbs. Like they're just these weird membrane orbs in our heads. They're like as fragile as like. They're so fragile. It's incredible that we don't go blind. Well, I'm. I mean, I guess I am blind. I shouldn't. I really shouldn't be scratching here. I guess I am blind. I need contacts, but like blind, blind. Like I'm surprised we can see with how sensitive our eyes are. Or maybe our eyes are relatively aren't very sensitive at all. Remember how I burned my forehead? That's barely visible now. That's incredible. Um, okay. Which we are truly liberated from all, all cares and activities necessitated by the life process, and therefore free for the world and its culture. It is rather left over time, which is still biological in nature. Okay, I think left over time and vacant time are the same thing. So I'm going to highlight them both to imply that they're the same. Look at how nice this highlighter is. It's like clear, so you can see what you're, what you're highlighting. Um, really fancy highlighter. It's, it's nice. Sharpie. Sharpie highlighter. Um, and it's like, it's shaped like a, like a stupid, like disposable vape. <laughs> God, I'm so happy I'm not addicted to nicotine. That stuff is so crazy. God, nicotine is so cringe. Nicotine addiction is like so, so cringe and L, respectfully. Um, like, just smoke weed. Like, what? Like, it's so crazy. Like, like, shut up. Like, it's so, like, nicotine addiction is so stupid. Um, God, God. It's cause my it's cause my parents smoke. Um, well, my mom used to smoke. My dad still smokes, and it's just, you know, like you you can see you can see what it does, to people. Like, it's crazy. Um, I, I'm sure I've talked about that on this channel. Um, okay, so Time consumed by art as entertainment, by the masses, by mass society. Is not leisure time. Where they are free of all worry. Instead, it is vacant time. The time that isn't biologically needed 
like sleep or food, work is also biologically work is also biological yet it is also conditioned Time consumed by art as entertainment by mass society is not leisure time where they are free of all worry. Instead, it is vacant time, the time that is biologically needed, like sleep or food. While work is also biological, yet, is, yet it is also conditioned. Under modern conditions, this hiatus is constantly growing. There is more and more time free that must be filled with entertainment. But this enormous increase in vacant time does not change the nature of the time. Entertainment, like, like labor and sleep, is, irre is irre irrevocably part of the biological life process. And biological life, as always, whether one is laboring or at rest, engaged in consumption, or in the po passive perception of amusement, metaboli a metabolism for feeding on things by devouring them. The commodities the entertainment industry offers are not things. Cultural objects whose excellence is measured by their ability to withstand the life process and become permanent appurtenances of the world. They should not be judged according to these standards. Are they then? Art has become a consumer good. Panis et circenses truly belong together. Both are necessary for life, is for its preservation and recuperation, and both vanish in the course of the life process. That is, both must be constantly produced anew and offered anew, lest this process cease entirely. The standards by which both are judged, and indeed freshness and novelty, by which, are, by which both should be judged and are indeed freshness and novelty, standards by which we today, and I think quite mistakenly, judge cultural and artistic objects as well, Things are things which are supposed to remain in the world long after we have left it. Okay. Due to this, art is partly judged by freshness and novelty, like a bakery's bread that must be consumed within the same day. As long as the entertainment industry produces its own consumer goods, all is well, and we can no more reproach it for the modern non-durability of its articles when we can reproach a bakery because it produces goods which, if they are not to spoil, must be consumed as soon as they are made. It has always been the mark of educated philistinism to d despise entertainment and amusement because no value can be derived from them. In so far as we are all subject to life's great cycle, we all stand in need of entertainment and amusement in one form or another. And it is sheer hypocrisy or social snobbery to deny that we can be amused and entertained by exactly the same things that amuse and entertain the masses of our fellow men. 
it's cringe to look down on art as something to be entertained by. Because everyone needs entertainment. And just because mass society participates in it, participates in art consumption doesn't mean doesn't justify snobbiness. It's cringe to look down on art as something to be entertained by because everyone needs entertainment, and just because mass society participates in art consumption doesn't justify snobbiness. Okay, and I think that's about half. Um, my English professor told uh, the class to read half by the next class, and next class is on Tuesday, so. Wow, that's pretty much it. God, that sucked. <laughs> well, I mean, it's good. It's good. It, it, it's it's good so far. Uh, I'm gonna read the other half. I guess on Wednesday, Wednesday through. Oh no, and I'll read the other half. But um, you know, when Renee tells me to. Um, yeah, that was really interesting. Um, it's interesting to think about how art has generally been considered. I have to use the restroom. I'll I'll tell you my thoughts in a second. Okay. Uh, it's certainly interesting to think about art as something that previously was just like a thing in high society or like society um, And as soon as mass society came around it sort of becoming a thing to be consumed for entertainment. Um, it's really interesting how um, What am I saying? It's interesting how Hannah describes like, initially describes everything as sort of a bad thing. Like, she initially describes mass society as sort of a bad thing as, and as something to be, like, try to run away, uh, as to, like, something to try and run away from. Uh, but then later she also describes mass society as something sort of, um, as sort of a unavoidable uh, group of people who consume art, and <laughs> who consume art. They're the only ones who consume art, but they're, like, a specific group of people who interact with art, and the thing they do with art is consume it. Um, and, you know... It's also interesting how she introduces that as a bad thing, but then uh, the more she talks about it, you realize that she's actually referring to how, you know, as because mass society is an all encompassing definition and you can't really escape from society, uh, from mass society just to become society in and of itself, um, it's sort of, it's, it's, it, to understand art better than other people is to, 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 to view art, hmm. just because mass society consumes art doesn't mean that we're all not humans who biologically need entertainment, and it also doesn't mean that you can look down on other people for just consuming art rather than like critically analyzing it. Um, however, but beca because of the mode of production that we're in, it, it makes sense um, when the mass society consumes art. They're also referring to, um, like, what am I saying? When mass society consumes art, they're also um, not participating in pure leisure time where they have no worries. They're participating in vacant time, the time in which they are not fulfilling their biological needs. You know, so they're replacing it with a biological need of entertainment, but it's not a vacant need. But it is a vacant need. It's not a, um, it's not, it's a, it's a, 
taking place during vacant time, not leisure time. Um, yeah, and the whole thing is, is interesting. Um, I assume I'm going to have a more nuanced perspective on it when literature class happens, because I sort of still have no idea what I just... I, I know what I just read, but I kind of don't. Um, so we'll find out next time. All right, see you. Man, hour and, a, hour and a half long video. Man, would you watch a Leo DiPio the movie? <laughs> Want to come over and watch the Leo DiPio movie, guys? Um, yeah, I don't know what I'm going to have for dinner. I might order food, but that is such a silly thing to do. Oh my god. I've been watching this guy, Caleb Hammer. He has this series called Financial Audit, where he looks at people's financial audits, and they eat out so much. All these people who have all this credit card debt, and they don't save, and instead of putting the money to pay off the credit card debt, they should get Uber Eats. And I don't want to eat, so Uber Eats degenerate, respectfully. So I'm probably not going to order Uber Eats. I'm probably going to eat leftovers because we have still have a lot of Spam fried rice. And we have so much food in the freezer, too. So, yeah. All right. See you, dude. Yeah. Goodbye.